record. And um, I thought we actually might start out this morning before we hop right into the book. Um, Darlene has been so kind as to prepare for us some Native American sayings that help mirror the spiritual um, the spirituality in, in Native communities or in nations uh, and give us an invitation to link that up with scripture as we uh, hop into the book. Now you'll find this list in the e-news today. So it's a PDF that you can link and download and save or print as you like. Um, but what I wanna do is hit share screen, Darlene, and then I wanna, um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to sort of give you free reign to say what you'd like, because you've been so generous to compile this like really amazing list. Mm. Uh, Mike, kind of give me a timeline. <laughs> go, no, no, you just go for it. This is, here we are. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, what I thought I'd do is talk to you a little about or share with you a little about the values of, uh, that are at the core of the Native American spirituality. I think if we have a feeling for that, uh, as we start uh, Charleston's uh, journey in matching his Native American spirituality with Christianity. Mm. So what he comes from, the core values of uh, his upbringing were based in giving, sharing, and cooperation. And they, these all uh, involve connection. Connection is the essence of Native American spirituality. Um, I thought what I'd do is read some of these and, and then we'll talk a little bit, talk a little bit, read some, talk a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, as you can, I'll read uh, probably the first 10 or so and you can go along with me. And as I read them, think in terms of this being oral scripture. Our scripture started out orally. Look in terms of what matches with our scripture, what matches with our Christian beliefs. And these are all uh, on the list. I've given you who quoted them. I mean, who said these things, but I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna attribute it to them as, as we go through it. Even as you desire good treatment, so render it. The earth and myself are of one mind. The monitor in my breast has taught me the will of the great spirit. These beads are a road between us. Take hold at one end. I will at the other and hold fast. The great spirit put it in the right place. I was going around the world with the clouds when God spoke to my thought and told me to be at peace with all. Have a vision not clouded by fear. Each man is good in his sight. It is not necessary for eagles to be crows. I love that one. The, the feeling of connection is available to all beings in Native American theology, and it's experienced in a variety of ways. In the Native American circle of life, all things are connected, all things have purpose, all things are worthy of respect and reverence. Everything in our natural environment coexists harmoniously. If you'll think in terms of the vision quests uh, that he uh, talks about, uh, the goal is connection and transformation. In the Native American philosophy, all aspects of life must be in harmony. The mind, the environment, the body, and the spirit. Let's read some of the other uh, quotations and see if you see those values in any of these. Mm -hmm. We do not want riches. We want peace and love. 
Too many have strayed from the path shown to us by the Great Spirit. Old Lakota knew that man's heart away from nature becomes hard. Listen or your tongue will make you deaf. The death of fear is doing what you fear to do. Do not hurt your neighbor for it is not him you wrong, but yourself. We took an oath not to do any wrong to each other or to scheme against each other. Why do you take by force what you could obtain by love? We are part of the earth and the earth is part of us. As a child, I understood how to give. I have forgotten this grace since I became civilized. <laughs> Since uh, this inner relationship might be disturbed by discord, the challenge for the Native American is to avoid conflict in order to balance this inner relationship of mind, body, and heart as a unified whole. Relationships are primary to the Native American philosophy. Individual behaviors are expected to be in harmony with nature. The person is valued above and beyond his or her possessions. Child rearing emphasizes self-sufficiency, which is always in harmony with nature. And respect for the elderly is absolute. I like that one, since I fall into that category now. The ancient wisdom provides a way of thinking and behaving, which facilitates the connection of the individual to oneself, that person's connection to others, connection to community, connection to nature, and a great universal spirit. Let's read a few more. Uh, we must help one another, and the great spirit will help us both. Every step you take should be a prayer. And if every take, step you take is a prayer, then you will always be walking in a sacred manner. Brothers, we must be united. We must smoke the same pipe. We must fight each other's battles. And more than all, we must love the great spirit. A single twig breaks, but the bundle of twigs is strong. Walk the good road, be dutiful, respectful, gentle, and modest. Be strong with warm, strong heart of the earth. Lose your temper and you lose a friend. Lie and you lose yourself. Which wolf will win? The old Cherokee elder replied, the one you feed. We will be known forever by the tracks we leave. All things share the same breath, the beast, the tree, the man. The air shares its spirit with all the life it supports. A big man gives away what he has and shares with others. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. I love the Native American spirituality. I think it dovetails nicely with our Christian Christian faith. Um, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I was impressed with how much it did uh, harmonize with the with our Christian faith. I, I knew absolutely nothing about. In, in the, theology, I didn't even know until I read, started reading this book that there was Indian theology. <clears throat> but I'm really impressed. And I think about how these people really walked with God and how they were destroyed by our ancestors. And Who were Christian. Most of them were Christian. Yeah, exactly. Who didn't have a clue. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And still don't have a clue, most of them. <laughs> Graciela, I can't hear you. Okay. We can't. I, I read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee some years ago. Yes. And mm -hmm. books that were related to that. So I knew, I, I didn't remember all of the specific but I had this a sense of the spirit that 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 the Native Americans had, and there was no doubt. I cried at the end of that book because it's uh, it's what we as well as a country, uh, and and the the fact that we had techno started technology, we had railroads, the railroads and the cars and the guns, and I mean th there's no way that these people were going to survive. Mm -hmm. way of life and it's 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 a, very, it's a very tragic loss for for our history mm -hmm. so i appreciate your bringing some of some especially the spirituality part back that's you know that's really cool because it's pretty beautiful thank you thank them yeah. oh yeah yeah I think this is uh, really an opportunity. I, I see now because of like where my journey has taken me that there is this incredible opportunity uh, for this to like open up the way that Christianity gets thought of and practiced. Although I do have to say that the way I was raised would not have found this like helpful at all. It would have said like, no way, this is all like animus or like shamanist or like, hedonistic kind of thinking so i i think what's interesting is to like is really to take maybe i think um one of the things that that the whole book offers to do is take christianity from like a set of doctrines and really invite contemplation on a way of life and I, I, I'm a little sad to say, I think that like at least American evangelical Christianity is very doctrine based and not way of life based. No, even today, the Southern Baptist Church is fighting to continue gender, uh, uh, gender discrimination against women regarding preaching and several other things that, uh, and they're supposed to be Christians. Uh, and how, how did people lose out? I mean, how? Anyway, I don't want to digress from that because I want to stay on the book. But it's just amazing to me how so-called Christians are screwed it up. Mm. Yeah. Later in the book, he talks about uh. uh religion, or not religions, spirituality being Catholic in that we all worship the great spirit. Mm -hmm. We just do it in different ways and in different paths. And it's when we break up into denominations and have those rigid rules that we become un-Catholic. Yeah. We're, we're narrowing the faith. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, again, Our I- Catholic I, means universal. Right, right. Sorry, little c. Actually, it's irrelevant whether you use the large or small c. The prayer okay. actually goes back and forth between. A lot of people okay. see the large c is referring to the Roman tradition, but yeah. the prayer book uses both to mean universal. Actually, yeah. As a as a big c Catholic, I th I agree. Thank you for saying that. Because I grew up with with a very uh, influential Catholic religion training and schooling. And... I do understand. Yes, I think <laughs> you would. <laughs> I, I think what I really appreciate, Darlene, particularly because uh, I know a little bit of the tradition that raised you church wise, uh, is to see, um, and this is something that the Episcopal Church, I think, needs to work on a little bit, um, quite honestly, is knowing the scriptures uh, very well and, and then using that knowledge to say, hey, instead of discarding what I don't like, the real question is, like, uh, what's the conversation embedded there? So it's worth taking time to get to know uh, as long as we have that conversation. And, and what you've done in this list 
uh, which by the way is incredible because I know that you've made this really just for us, is that you have drawn out some amazing um, analogs in scripture, right? I mean, beginning with as you desire good treatment, so render it, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? I mean, it's just a yes. different phrasing of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's this bit about every single one of these, the, the little, um, uh, the, the bibliophile in me just really appreciates, like, um, there's this line in here about um, a single twig breaks, but the bundle of twigs is strong, right? And that comes right out of the book of Proverbs, right? That uh, a cord of two strands is not easily broken, you know? And so, you know, I... And this I really appreciate that you've done is dovetailed. I mean, I could almost pull up a mental memory verse out of the Bible for every one of the ones you've put, but by putting them together, what you've done is, is offered a way to really uh, enlarge the worldview that scripture could offer instead of reading these as just like passing things this is like a world it's really like taking a two-dimensional worldview and inflating it to be to have depth as well mm -hmm. and these are core values for humankind yeah. they're not just our values they're not just our episcopal or our baptist values right they're core human values yeah and they they address core human needs the, the human needs to uh, belong, uh, of mastery, of a s generosity. I mean, the, these are basic values and basic human needs that are met by the, the Catholic, <laughs> small z, Catholic version of the Great Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing that I think is really great um, just to, to put forward again is just this this idea of that the Dolores Williams really said about ministerial vision and um, particularly this line from Pal Houghton why do you take by force what you could obtain by love mm -hmm. and uh, to tie that into that um, that phrase I think can can even mean in certain people's heads like in my own past it can mean like oh like love is the is the means to get the ends you want which I think is the distortion of the phrase, right? The real question is, what are you after? Converting other people or being converted, which I think is what the book really argues is that this is not a journey of transcendence. It's a journey to be transformed. Yes. And the transformation is, is, has a, a community goal. I mean, we transform our yes. relationship with the great spirit, with our God, so that we can come back from the vision quest and be of service to our community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I that, love that. That, that is, mm -hmm. that is so, uh, uh, that, that just touches my heart. It, it, you know, if you read any mystic, any mystic that ca gets caught up in an ecstatic vision, um, it only really works if you come back transformed so mystics don't try to transcend reality. They come back and try to transform their community. And, Which uh, grounds us into reality. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not supposed to be up there in the clouds. We're supposed to be here in reality, working with each other, loving each other. Yeah, thank you. No, I, it's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to segue away. I think what you've done is given us a really great basis for us to, to now look at if it's okay to, to, to move into a little bit, um, re reactions that you've had from reading this book, uh, at least the introduction in the first two chapters. So I, I want to see, uh, based on what you were able to read, if there were standout um, ideas, maybe they were new or they were transfiction and they caught you a little bit. Uh, again, maybe they rubbed you the wrong way, or maybe they prompted your your thinking. And um, Julia is not able to join us this morning, but she sent me a few uh, reflections that I'll offer in her in her stead in, in a, a little bit. Well, I was, uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
uh, I just was completely taken with all of this. And um, I found it to be very thoughtful and insightful. And, um, um, you know, it's, um, I see that there are some comparison in Christianity about the quest. And that in those, back in the day, we used to call those retreats, mm. you know, and that, and it had basically the same purpose. How that's going today, I don't know. There seems to be so little time for spiritual things these days. Uh, this man, uh, Vine Dolores, uh, he points that out very carefully that, um, you know, we want things instantly now and so forth. So I don't, so, any, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. maybe some particular ideas will pop up here to me in a little bit as I listen to some of y'all. Uh, but uh, I think that I'm really grateful to have this book to read. Thank you. Uh, I want to share one of Julia's just initial reactions, which I thought was really fascinating. And it's sort of caught me in general, not just in this book, but in a lot of other ways. Uh, Julia suggested that in the intro statement, um, Charleston writes that his ancestors have been around for 35,000 years. And that when you think about European settlements only being 500 and settling the mm -hmm. land, it's this really interesting opportunity to reconsider what we've always known. And uh, if I can just say briefly, Christianity in terms of its emphasis has really taken a change in the last hundred years that many of us don't even realize. And that the first thousand years, just for example, there was no discussion about um, us being filthy rags or being natural born evil and things like that. So we don't even realize our own tradition Mm -hmm. how much it's changed of late and how we've <laughs> there's this opportunity to explore this earlier perspective and return to it I mean I, that's the biblical word is return which really just means repent right mm -hmm. and so I thought that was a really interesting reflection from Julia as how sometimes we think like oh my gosh you know next year the United or is it this year are we turning 200 no, I was thinking about this the other day. In five years, we're turning 250 as a nation, and that can feel really, really old. And then you think about people living here for 35,000 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and they maintained the beauty of the earth for so long before, and it's only taken humanity 500 years to destroy it. Uh, you know, I was thinking the other day about uh, the second coming of Christ. And I'm thinking, well, is there going to be a earth <laughs> for Christ to come to again? Yeah. Of course, everything is in God's timing. So I was just, you know, saying at the rate we're destroying the earth, will that fit in with Jesus' plans to come a second time? But um, the, um, and you know, it makes, I grieve for what we have done as a people and, uh, I don't know how we're going to turn it around, but I'm hope I'm 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 sure God has something in mind. But I'm not looking out at what I see in the world today very positively. I think there are going to be some real hard times to come for quite a while. I think the question I have, or the concern that I have is we may be looking at these through Christian eyes and not through their eyes. Because mm -hmm. their eyes, I think, are a little bit different than what we may be thinking about. Would you elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, well, um, there, there, there were, there were a, approximately 500 tribes in the, the, the North America, and mm -hmm. they were all not very friendly with each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's were, true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they were uh, the Comanches, for example, um, were slave holders. Uh, they attacked other tribes. Um, when they would kill their enemies, sometimes they would eat them. So you know we 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 need to look at how they are looking at their connection with the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
because their connection may not be the same as the Lakota Sioux, for example. Yeah. 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 It, uh... I think that's a really helpful reminder, Tim, mm -hmm. is that sometimes we say like, oh, there's the native ways, as if that's like one group of people. And, uh, and in our head, it sort of can be because the author doesn't use this word, but I have, I recently heard a discussion from, there's a canon for Native American communities in the Episcopal church. Like there's somebody that's their entire sort of call the ministry. And they uh, gave a presentation describing um, the intentional genocide of Native Americans by Europeans, by which they defined the word genocide to mean making a people disappear. Mm -hmm. It didn't necessarily mean killing them, but erasing their native language and their native customs and hiding them away in like um, places we tend not to want to visit, otherwise known as reservations. <laughs> and so it's, it's interesting, I think, because very few um, Europeans, first of all, know a Native American person <laughs> and then have any understanding about how Choctaw and Cree and Sioux how they might have, you know, had different ways of life and different ways of being, we just sort of tend to lump them in one aggrandized category uh, because we just don't, we just don't even know about the variety and diversity. And that is one of the contributions that I perceive this book is going to make is that each chapter you're going to hear like a custom or a lens of viewing the world from a different um, American native nation. And he uses that word. These aren't tribes, these are sovereign nations. So sort of it's interesting to think through how we mm -hmm. reduce to tribes what used to be uh, essentially sovereignty. Yeah. But I think you make a really, really fine point, Tim. Yeah, and Jim, that reminds me too. You know, human nature has not changed. In other words, we're still doing, we're doing the same things that people have who have preceded us have done. And, um, you know, I often say to God, how can you keep on putting up with this? You know, um, we human nature hasn't changed in millennia. Some people, now there are people who get better. There are people who do transform, but in general, it makes me wonder. God is awfully patient. Well, I'm, I'm coming in late, but oh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm muted. No, no, you're on, yeah. Sandra. Keep going. You're good. Okay, but for something something I belong to, I just got a map of the uh, of the either the states or Texas. I'm sorry, with the the native tribes, and you wouldn't believe it. It's just full. Every inch mm -hmm. is full of tribes, and so. And I also think I may have the Dolores book that you talked about about the red red man and the. Anyway, but anyway, I'm in God, God is Red, I believe is the book. Yeah. Uh, Vine Deloria. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to this and I'm just coming in late. So, yeah. Well, you know, my grandmother is half Indian <clears throat> and she comes from the tribe that's near Livingston in that area there. So that makes my mother a quarter. I think me, what, a 16th or something like that? But, you know, but none of that was shared with us uh, because, well, you know, it was just because uh, they were hidden, I guess you would say. And there were so many other crazy problems in my family who had time to do it. <laughs> Even though there are a, a huge number of different tribes or nations, uh, if you look more closely at the quotations, they come from a variety of different tribes, different nations. And the, there's a theme, the overall theme is of connection and valuing each other. So, so yes, some of the tribes were at war with each other. Some were very peaceful tribes, mm -hmm. but even those that were warring, uh, with each other had the core values of cooperation yeah. and helping each other and valuing each other and valuing the earth and, and their the nation and their nation and their yeah yeah and I think uh, as you as the book unfolds I'm just going to look ahead a little bit having read it already 
there's a chapter that's about the Hopi people and how the Hopi people mm -hmm. believe that their call is to actually keep the earth like alive. And if they don't do what they're meant to do, the whole earth uh, kind of hangs in the balance. And um, what's great is that the more you learn about uh, um, variant Jewish and Christian traditions, those people exist, right? So if you're a member of the Kabbalah, if you're Jewish, I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one analogy, but there's this phrase, tikkun olam, the healing of the world. And, and that is why you practice Judaism, to, to heal the world. And without you, the world will not be healed. It will sort of self-destruct. And so it's, you know, it's interesting to, sometimes we don't realize, sometimes we think Christianity itself is so monolithic. And while there can be some core values, there's a whole lot of diversity, you know, yeah. and, and I think that's what you've done really well, Darlene, is, is also drawn mm -hmm. out from diverse spaces. Hey, there is some, some core bit, but there's also this diversity and it does us good to remember that there has always been that diversity in Christian practice as well, if we'll just be aware of it. Well, you know, the Hopi is also a matriarchal nation. And uh, so uh, that sort of Mother Earth and matriarchy sort of go together. Yeah. And, and we also saw some of the same thing when we were in Peru, because the Quechuan thinks about the Earth as their mother. Mm -hmm. And so they want to take care of it. Um, I want to ask you, Julia had this question about, um, she had this obviously really positive reaction about the idea, or she was very struck by the quote that the incarnation is God's vision quest. And the quest becomes tangible because it's embodied. And um, she just wanted to sort of air your reaction to those ideas. The incarnation is God's vision quest and that it becomes tangible because it's embodied. Well, if um, Jesus being truly human would have human experiences, and so uh, in the beginning of his earthly life, as a human child, he would have to learn uh, things that kids at that age had to learn. Now, of course, uh, being who he was, now this is coming from... Um, that book, uh, Jesus, A New Vision by Schreiber, um, you know, uh, he uh, probably was a very precocious child, we could say, because, you know, he has the divinity in him also. So he, but, so he has his human journey as finding out who he is with the combination of the two. And then, uh, so you could look at his life as a quest. Uh, God learns how to be human and uh, has to have human experiences to really be able to look at the human, uh, at what humans feel and experience and think about. And, uh, and out of that comes our redemption. So where do you think about that? I thought I saw you ready to say something, Darlene, but maybe not. Okay. Well, I think- Wait, what, what, do you agree or disagree? In other words, come on, give me some kind of thought on this. You're asking the group, I know. Yeah. So I'm a heretic? No. <laughs> I'm just having to, I'm, I'm just, personally, I'm just thinking through what you said, yeah. and and it, it's uh, complicated. Well, I want to be a heretic for a second and say, actually, that kind of thinking implies a little bit of process theology, which is this understanding that, like, God is also on a journey. Uh, because if God needed a vision quest that's anchored in time, and that happens somewhere in the middle of human time span. Uh, it implies that that God is still learning, which is sort of interesting to think through. It kind of clashes with the Western idea that God doesn't need to learn anything, uh, but it seems like it fits the native idea. And then I'm going to be even more heretical and uh, and just offer this thought 
that uh, we usually say, right, that um, the unique thing about Jesus is that he's fully human and fully divine at the same time, right? Um, but then we have this other idea that God is everywhere all the time, like omnipresent. So here comes this really tough question, right? Is God more present in Jesus than God is in you? No. Or the same. Jesus is just aware of God's presence and our journey is to be similarly aware. I know that's a heretical question, but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't have any problem with that because the three in one, um, the, 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 the Holy Trinity is present, present in all of us. The question is, is how much are we aware of that and how much do we uh, live into it? That's, that's my take on it. Well, if, if, if he is present in each one of us, why are we not like Jesus? Because Perfect. do we pursue that? In other words, do we wait for th God to do things to us, for us? Or how much do we seek God? so that God can become more present in us. Like the Native American saying said, let every step be a prayer. Yeah. I, and, I, I guess- And I'm what happens is that over time, that just becomes part of you. In other words, you don't have to be making a lot of effort to say, okay, I need to remember to God today and to remember, you know, keep, just uh, to uh, you know, always be reminding myself. After a while, it becomes part of you. There is a transformation that takes place, and it becomes easier. And then God pulls you closer, and you go deeper. So, but the thing is, this in the beginning, do you really seek? Do you really seek a loving, personal relationship with God? If you don't, then you're going to be having all this doctrine stuff running around in your head. But if 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 God is is present with each one of us as he was with Jesus, why do we sin and he did not? Uh, and this is a great question, right? I think it gets us to the question of like what sin really is. And yeah, what's free will? I, well, I think we've settled, Tim, in general, like our default is, oh, like a sin is when you break some kind of moral law instead of sin is like a burden that you carry. And so like, to be honest with you, like you can read the gospels and Jesus does stuff that's a little bit unsavory. I'm just going to be honest, like, like whipping folks or calling that Syrio Phoenician woman like a female dog. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, those are like not okay things. And so the question is, not does he ever do things that we should not do. The question is, what does he do after he does those things? Mm -hmm. And in the case of the Syrophoenician woman, my hope is that he learns a lesson. Uh, and maybe the difference is he learns it the first time. Instead of like me, it takes like a thousand times that playing <laughs> out before I'm like, oh, <laughs> look at that. Oh, dear. <laughs> I mean, I no, I'm being serious, right? And I'm just going to tell you honestly, like you don't, you don't have to be like a clever reader. When you read the Gospel of John, the disciples are like, are you going to Jerusalem for the Passover? And Jesus says, no, I'm not. And then secretly he goes. And I'm sorry, friends, that's the definition of lying. So he tells a lie. Yeah. So I think if we say like, oh, like Jesus never like does anything like unsavory, I think we've missed the opportunity for like following the guy. <laughs> I think the real question is like, hey, uh, and John Wesley says this so well. He says, being ignorant is not a sin. Staying ignorant is a sin. I mean, it's a sort of this, this interesting bit, which I actually perceive to be very um, um, pre-puritanical thinking that, um, you know, part of the goal of child rearing is not to have perfect children, but to have children who are curious and learn and learn from their mistakes. And so like one of the things that Brene Brown says is like when, when a child makes a, a mistake, do you celebrate it or do you castigate it? And that can make a really, really big difference, right? Because 
essentially mistakes are just the scientific method playing out. And it's like, hey, good job. You tried something and it failed miserably. So what do you want to do next time? You know, like mm -hmm. instead of like, how dare you? It's you tried. That was really cool. And like, what'd you learn about it? And and I, I don't want to sound silly, but I think sometimes we can and and really good theologians who are like Jesuit folks say this too. Sometimes we put Jesus on so much of a pedestal that we forget that he offers to inform the way we live instead of being on an ivory tower somewhere. And, and sometimes we make him so extraordinary, we forget how ordinary his invitation is. Yeah. And I think that's very native as I yes. read the book, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I do. And that's where I think coming back to vision is so interesting. Um, he talks about these components of vision. And again, that vision is really not about climbing some kind of uh, staircase to heaven. It's actually sort of an inverted pyramid in which you, you have this experience and you try to bring this deeper reality to earth and to community. Julia wanted me to ask, and this is a highly personal question, has anybody ever had a vision experience? I, I had moments not. of awareness, but never, uh, you know, never a picture. <laughs> Ellen, please. I haven't, but I, I certainly am intrigued by this definition of vision. Uh, I was really struck initially by the, the, the statement that anyone can have a vision. It's not just the mystics. And mm -hmm. so it's like, open to any of us if we choose to follow that path or make that attempt. You know, I, when I was a, a child in Catholic school and we had confession every Friday, there were some times, and, and I, for, you know, unless you're a raised Catholic, it, this may sound strange, <laughs> but you know, you had a list of the, 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 what just the sins could be. So then you'd, uh, there was even a, a list of films in the back of the church or the wall of the church or the door of the church. And, and did you see that movie? Did you see that movie? And, and, and those, those would be sins if you went to see this movie or did you read this book? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, those, there was a vision, but I remember going to confession and thinking I really believed I had this deep sense of cleanliness. Of, it was, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know, and, and maybe Meg can help me out because she was raised Catholic. I, I just, I don't, and I don't know, that's, a, that's not a vision, but I remember having that sensation of, of it, everything was okay because I'd gone through this exercise. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe I'm just rambling and not making- No, I didn't think so. I think actually I sometimes again, we, we, if we say like a vision is something you have that's like powerfully apocalyptic and predictive, then very few people are gonna answer affirmatively. But I think if you don't mind me saying, I, I think visions are the kinds of things in which you find yourself interconnected with the rest of the world. And by that criterion, I would say I have had, um, I've had visions and they're very, and, and they've been very fleeting, if I'm honest, they're usually really short. And I, this isn't what, um, um, Mr. Charleston says, it's what Martin Buber says, there's this interesting bit in, in Revelation where as soon as you're aware that you're caught up in a vision, it's over. It's over. Because you've now like encapsulated it with words, right? And so like when you try to own or control a vision, you, 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 you've you tried to wrap up something that refuses to be tamed and it will leave you. Could you <laughs> Martin uh, says that too, right? Thomas Burton says your true self is going to run away from you if your goal is to capture it. <laughs> yeah, could could uh, uh, another way of considering vision be given insight, insights into situations? Yes, I think visions visions we can't describe them. I mean, mm -hmm. words try to contain a vision, and the vision is not containable. It doesn't have to be 
sight or sound. It can be thought. It can be feelings. I love the, the quotes. Um, I was going around the world with the clouds when God spoke to my thought and mm -hmm. told me to be at peace with all. Mm -hmm. or another one, the monitor within my breast has taught me the will of the great spirit. Mm -hmm. Th those are visions. Mm -hmm. it, 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 they have a beautiful, the, these quotes have a beautiful way of describing their vision. It's not what I think of when I'm going to define a vision. You're, it's not okay. just seeing or hearing mm -hmm. things or people appearing to you. I, I think visions have a really broad definition and no definition at all, perhaps. Yeah, I know that's really fair. And a lot of times we talk as priest people about our call to ministry. And maybe I can just say a few words about some of those. I had a professor in college who was a missionary to the, uh, the Maasai tribes in Africa. And his call to ministry was that he went to hear some missionaries uh, at his church when he was a kid. And um, he saw like in he saw flames like while they were talking and the flames spelled the word Japan. And I was like, well, you never followed your call to ministry then because you didn't go there. He was like, oh, of course it wasn't about Japan at all. That was like, that was like at that time, that was what that meant for me. But of course, like I went to Africa because that was how that changed out for me. But it, it, the, the vision I had was not so anchored in, um, in uh, literality. And that's what allowed me to take it seriously. It was something like that is what he said. And um, sometimes you meet clergy people and they feel very like strong internal, like God wants this. And the, the guy on your screen is not that guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've just never really felt like that. In fact, I get really afraid when people talk like that because that's not how I process the world. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I talked to the commission on ministry, what I said is I kept doing different stuff and I kept coming back to like, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, that was good enough for them. And quite honestly, it's been good enough for me is that I keep having these fleeting moments that are like, where does my brain go? Where does my core energy go? Whether I'm teaching math or laying tile or uh, sending direct mail. And, and that was these little moments put together were sort of my vision. Isn't, uh, isn't the definition of a vision a quest in the Native American, something that changes your life. You come back with a brand new name or something. He talks about how that is often the case, although he, yeah. you know, the vision he describes, he said, I didn't get a new name, but I was different. And so I think like, if it's fair to say, we might use a different word like epiphany to describe vision because an epiphany is not just a fact you learn it like reorients the lens with which you look at the world and i would tell you for example if you've ever um had like a cognitive category for somebody is less than you or can't do this thing and then you have an interaction with them and you change your category i'd call that a vision so let's pretend right that you did not think that um same-sex relationships were okay and then you met a gay person as a person found out they were gay and then realized your categories had to be redefined. I'd call that a vision according to these criteria that he uses. Now there's no crows involved, right? But, but that is a transformation and, and, and it's a transformation, not a transcendence because you've met somebody who is beneath you and realized that you're on the same plane. So I, I, you know, I think part of what's what's weird for us, Tim, is that we are. Um, I think in our Western, and it's it's coming back a little bit, a very little bit. But I do think that we tend to be very hierarchical with the way we view the natural world and with animals. And as a result, I think we tend not to have visions that way. But if you read through the prophets, uh, they offer us some really incredible images that can be life changing. And, and I just give you one, right? The wolf will lie down with the lamb. Um, I mean, that's, that's Isaiah's vision. And to really, like, you can study around that and you can think around that. And it also can just sort of transform this idea, right? I mean, a, a wolf will only lie down with the lamb when 
when the, the nature of things as we know it has been changed. Yeah. I think sometimes we can study visions other people have had, like the prophets, and they can offer to inform and reform the way we the way we live and conceive of other people. And so sometimes the visions of others can become our vision. That's why we read the Bible, I think. <laughs> oh, no, talking about the change, that at the end of the vision quest, the person gets a, uh, sometimes gets a new name because they have changed. That's why I go by Meg and not Margaret. Uh, because, Margaret was so damaged and so hurt that God got me to the point of where I realized that I was going to have to identify with this new adult side of myself so that I could help Margaret. And so that's why I go by Meg. Uh, it, you know, it's not a big chance of anything like that. It doesn't have to be, but, um, but that's how God worked with me on healing. That's a beautiful story. Thank you for mm -hmm. selling that. I, I think that's, that's really, um, and it feels real and honest. And I, that's really cool, Nick, Meg. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Uh, uh, when I first came to the Episcopal Church with the St. Thomas, and I saw what the com com community was like, and what they believed, that changed me. Mm. Um, you know, it wasn't anything that came out of the sky or anything else. It was simply a feeling that I belonged here rather than over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we, again, I think the opportunity of the book, I mean, I do think that some of us, we have these, what we would consider, and we probably only know it retrospectively grander moments of transition in our lives where we can see like oh in that one moment like the course of my life altered significantly and even at the time we may not have even known that right but I think um I don't I don't think I'm doing a disservice to say like inviting that those moments are vision moments for us and uh Meg just a follow up on you I don't know that everybody on the screen has had nicknames during their lives but there is an interesting way we do our identity with the names we invite people to call us and and I would tell you I didn't I haven't thought about it as consciously as what you just said Meg but you know I I have said this before if I introduce myself as Mike and somebody says nice to meet you Michael <laughs> it's infuriating actually because mm -hmm. I haven't given that permission of intimacy taken from me and uh, there are people who still call me that but they're very very relegated my own wife does not call me that because i haven't really given her that permission actually so it's interesting to think through and what that means for me um i i do i would call the stuff a vision and i would call it identity formation as well and and i think that's where things can really overlap mm -hmm. This has been a beautiful discussion because it's, it's, it's been um, the, uh, kind of deep, but on the other hand, it's become so intimate and personal. Uh, and and th it's really special. You know, my name is Graciela and um, people call me Gracie and they call me Grace and, the, and but it's Graciela. And my, but my dad, he called me Gracie, I don't know why, G-R-A-C-I-E-L-A, -E and he called me Gracie, but he's the only one, I didn't like it if people called me Gracie, I preferred Graciela, but uh, he, he could call me Gracie, and that was okay, <laughs> I, did, I don't know what, I don't know what that was, or what, what that's about, but it was from being a little kid, um, but I love my dad, he and I were close, uh, if you could call me Gracie, <laughs> Meg. <laughs> well, I have a name thing too. My name is Martha Ellen, and I have never been called Martha. Uh, and as I, I began to hear Bible stories, I detested the name Martha because I connected that with 
the one who had to stay in the kitchen while Mary got to be at Jesus' feet mm -hmm. until somewhere along the way, somebody was talking about that story and gave me a different perspective on how each of these women were fulfilling certain roles and they were both valuable. And so now I don't mind when people call me Martha uh, because on, oftentimes it's on my accounts and things like that. My good friends always call me Ellen, but it was a revelation to me when I finally heard this other definition of that story or the telling of that story and it made it okay that that I had Martha in my name. Mm. Thank you. That's yeah, beautiful. sometimes having to redeem to redeem ourselves is important. Mm -hmm. Does any did anybody else have an issue with um, you know the author uh, talks quite a bit about embodiment actually and. Um, you know, one of the things that Julia shared is that we do have this struggle, particularly in Christian tradition against claiming embodiment. We tend to actually think of like spirit is different from the body and superior and that the body is this sort of like, in some ways, uh, corrupted thing the spirit has to reside in. I know you might be thinking, well, I don't think that, but I'm going to tell you the majority of Western Christian thinking does think that. And so um, <laughs> I don't know if any of you are still kind of like chewing on that, not just in the book, but personally. No, I see it as one. Uh, there was a time when I did think that, uh, you know, that the spirit was indwelling a body that was up to no good. But uh, but I don't I don't think that way anymore. I see it as one, and um, it um, it feels good. I think it goes with this thing called transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you advance with God and become, and God makes changes in you that you some, most of the time you're not even aware that God is working with you. And then one day you wake up and say, you know, that I think different about that or I feel different or whatever, you know, and you f feel a closeness developing with God that you did not have before then it's easy to see the spirit and the body as one. And so, yes, we, it, we will separate when we uh, leave this planet, but um, uh, the, we need to take, care, take good care of the body because it supports a beautiful spirit. I think the, for me, the, the early upbringing uh, and uh, another denomination emphasized the fact that the body was not good, that uh, this was the seat of our sin and, and behavior where when you stop and think about it, or when I stop and think about it, <laughs> it's the spirit that is more important and maybe controls the actions of the body. So they're both one together, but separate. Yeah, and it's how we think that really rules. In other words, how we think is how we feel and how we feel is how we act. So the thinking affects body and spirit. So we need to be careful about how we think because what we think is what we're going to do or not do. I'm aware that my thinking about body and spirit, my body and spirit is shifting. Um, and it may be common to all of us as we age. Uh, up until say the last few years, I've always been very active, very strong, very physical exercise, uh, 
work hard. I mean, physical mm -hmm. labor work. I mean, I've seen myself as a strong person in body. And so that image of myself has been very physical. Uh, the spiritual was always there, but the physical was in the forefront. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, as I've aged, begin to age and um, not as strong as I used to be and have periods of times of when I can't do anything at all. Uh, it's, it's like I'm redefining that physicality of myself and I'm, I'm having to let go of some of that self-image and therefore the spiritual part of me is beginning to be more present. I'm more, it's always been there, but more aware of the spirituality. Mm -hmm. And so it's moving more into the forefront. Um, and I, I'm thinking, hmm, there must be some divine wisdom in that. Maybe I like to have a purpose for what's happening in my body. You know, what is in my life? What, what message do I have to, I've always asked God, what do you want me to learn from this? <laughs> and maybe what I'm supposed to be learning from this aging process is that just pay attention and, and look at what opportunities am I being given to connect with mm -hmm. the great spirit mm -hmm. without being so tied up in all the physical stuff. Just be open. Thank you. I mean, I think, and I'm young, right? So in my own experience, and I don't know if it's uh, more masculine than feminine in terms of the ways that I've like been raised and instructed, but I think through the way that like particularly participating in sports has kind of encultured my brain to kind of fight my body uh, so that my will can master my body. And I still get into trouble sometimes where I will get hurt because I subjugate my body to more training than I should, or, um, you know, for the, for some particular goal, I'll, I'll go on a longer run than my body told me I ought to. And it's like knowing when to say like, Hey, we're doing this no matter what, or like, Ooh, it really is time we pay attention. That wasn't to really, um, a discernment given to me. It was always just go, 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 go. And you know, it's interesting to hear people like LeBron James say, like, I rest two days a week, like where I don't do anything. And it really, like, that's a theology of rest. But how we navigate that individually is, is like sort of hard. And it comes back to this like holistic part of knowing what conversation to have with our own body and how much we fight our natural urges and how much we appreciate them. And to me, I'm still like in the middle of trying to figure that, that out. Because again, I think I was formed not only in the sports world, but in the church world mm -hmm. to like resist your body. Yeah. Yeah, it's a common teaching uh, from the church. But you know, um, with talking about um, aging, uh, aging, uh, it's frustrating in, in a lot of ways because we do lose powers that we had before. And uh, so I identify a lot with what you're saying, Darlene, about what like, used to do more, but now <laughs> there are days when I think, oh, I'm just not going to fool with it. But it's also a time when we have more time to think than we have had. But, but and you know, it, and you've heard me say this before, to look back at the, at the events of our lives and to make peace where we need to make peace, to forgive where we need to forgive, to forgive ourselves. I mean, all kinds of things to let go of. And, you know, maybe things that we didn't understand that when they happened, we had now have better insight and can understand and say, and so, and if we always blamed ourselves for that, maybe we, with the different, with a deeper understanding, we say, no, I was a kid or something like that. Or, you know, that I could see how that person misunderstood me. And, you know, I, I call it an advance on uh, standing before God. And, you know, I, every now and then I make the, the proud mistake 
of saying, well, you know, God, I've been up through so much <laughs> over the, this past year, my years of life, that is, I, am I going to have anything else to tell you? And, you know, always something comes up, <laughs> you know, but the thing is that, and another thing you can do is look and see how you traverse the world and how you survived obstacles and problems and came through them and all of those things have contributed god is with you in all those things and has created you to be the person you are today with this beautiful spirit that you have within you yes you have a tired body but your spirit is still very much alive and getting closer to god which is appropriate because you're going to meet him soon or, or meet her or whatever, you know. So that's the way I look at it. I think old aging can be a blessing, but time, but there are times when it is a pain, plain old pain in the backside. You know, I saw we start out as we get helpless in old age, it's come to me that, you know, we started out in diapers and we end up in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> So be old babies. <laughs> I called my my uh, autoimmune things. I've had two, one in the mid eighties and the one I have now. But my spiritual my spiritual directors, because to get out of the the mess that the autoimmune thing puts you in, I've had to seek out meditation groups, things that I normally wouldn't follow up, and uh, it's it's made my life considerably more enriched. Although I I wish I didn't have it to begin with, but still. Because I have had it, I've had some really good experiences. Mm -hmm. When I was, you know, when I was talking about giving my my uh, religious books to the uh, Indian, possibly people that were from India, uh, one of them was that I, I became uh, first time I, I learned about meditation for my eyes, and uh, and I belonged to an interfaith meditation group, which led me to belonged to this group, which uh, the leader was a tenured professor, first tenured professor at A&M, but who knew, who worked with uh, people in the sort of the Middle East in the area. She knew Baklav Havel um, and uh, a Pakistani woman. But she also knew in uh, India, this man that worked with the untouchables, Alexander Natavali. And uh, uh, he came and, and met with our group and uh, showed us films and all the work that he had done and what he would do is just go be a Hindu I think but sit with the uh, the untouchables and and they would sort of begin to do things have ideas of going group fishing so they all combined and and group uh, growing things because it kind of lifted them up out of out of the untouchable level that they had but then I found out about Ten years later, at, um, when I was invited to a uh, uh, thing at the uh, Episcopal uh, Church in England, he was given the I forgot the name of it, but some huge reward because he had brought um, of the work that he had done with the Untouchables, and uh, so I just feel like my life has been considerably enriched by the things I've sought out, and so I think that's a, a way of being touched by other things. Thank you. Well, let me ask if there's any concluding questions or um, insight from this particular book that we want to bring bring to the fore uh, today. Maybe I would ask you to ponder, and we could start with this next week if you're willing. And if you hate this question, it's fine too. But what it might take to create space in your life or to create space in church life to encourage people to have the kind of visions um, that are being described, whether they involve animals or just transformation images or whatever it is that they involve, that they have these four elements of preparation and community. Uh, he, one place he says lament, and another place he says expressing our deepest longings, which I appreciate having both of those. And then, of course, uh, he, the third element, I didn't mean to skip it, but uh, disciplining our intentions. So um, maybe I can leave you with that question to contemplate and we can pick up with it next time. How do you make space in your life? How do we make space as a congregation uh, to encourage vision questing? 
thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate your participation, as always. And I look forward to seeing what happens with you in the next couple of chapters next week. Okay, y'all take care and have a good rest of the week.